Uh, good afternoon and thank you for this opportunity to take part in this conference. Um, I've had the privilege of working um, for the last 20 years in a be beautiful um, and leafy suburb of Glasgow called Drum Chapel, um, which has a rich cultural history, um, a history that stretches back to the Middle Ages and some beautiful green spaces. It's also suffered the misfortune of the past 30 years to experience poverty and social exclusion as a direct result of government policies. And um, I'm lucky enough to work in a small medical practice there. I've got three of my colleagues from the practice here with me. I've been asked to speak about community practice and I'd like to ask the question of what is community? For the NHS, the definition is very clear. Community is not hospital. It sounds funny, but it's actually how the NHS views community. This fundamental error in thinking was introduced in the 19th century, and I think is one of the main reasons why the health service is on the brink of collapse. It has two ramifications. The first consequence is that community means outside, something on the periphery. I refer patients to outpatient clinics. Um, as opposed to inpatients. Uh, respiratory uh, clinics have respiratory outreach nurses somewhere out there. So community is somehow outside, it's peripheral, it's marginal to the core business of the National Health Service. That core business is the heart, it's the inside. Uh, we admit patients to hospital as if to some hallowed sanctuary, some holy centre. Despite the fact that people with rheumatological conditions, respiratory conditions, cardiovascular conditions, and almost any medical condition you can stretch your imagination to think of, spend 99.9% .9 of their lives outside of hospital, those specialists who provide their care are on the inside, and we're in the community, we're outside. I'd like you to think, I'd like to come back to that question at my end of my little talk. Um, but I wonder if you could think for yourself, what does community actually mean? This is the reason I became a GP. Um, and if you ask me, um, I'd probably be a bit shy to say it, because it's got lots of um, rather abstract terms, but it's actually the thing that makes me tick. I was delighted to have seen it in a previous slide and feel very smug that I included the whole quote. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, when I started out on my GP journey, um, I was supported and encouraged by Graham Watt. Um, and I was able to take these ideas, which I'd, uh, I'd never heard of dual intuited heart. I'd come across these ideas as a student um, in Latin America. Um, but through Graham's example, I was able to start thinking about and trying to work out for myself, what does these high and mighty sounding ideas mean in reality? One of the most memorable days in my life was about four or five years ago um, when we had an afternoon with my colleagues in the practice and we asked what kind of GP practice would we like to be. We'd never had that conversation before after years of working together and Andrew Lyon, who is known to some of you, came and helped us to think about Third Horizon, imagining your future because you're the ones that make it. And to my astonishment and genuine um, wonder, I discovered that the people I'd been working side by side with for all these years, actually the thing that made them tick was the declaration of Alma Atta as well. We didn't use those words, we didn't refer to it, because those words are not personal, they're not beautiful, they're not deeply felt in the way that we talked about it that afternoon. But uh, those things that made me tick also made my GP colleagues tick. We didn't get the memo from Professor Mercer, this is all pie in the sky. <laughs> so this is what the University of Drumchapel has come up with as the declaration of Alma Atta for us in Drumchapel. And I'd just like to spend the next few minutes just talking through the four ways in which we've tried to operationalize that abstract declaration of Alma Atta. And we've never even mentioned it once to each other. I think it's the first time I've probably mentioned it to my colleagues. I'd just like to point out the flag, Gerskadenburn Medical Practice. 
Garskaden Burn, um, to the uninitiated eyes, is a dribble of filthy water full of shopping trolleys. <laughs> But to those with eyes to see, it is an absolutely beautiful nature reserve which has protected status as a site of scientific interest and is in fact the little river that created the valley in which Drum Chapel sits. And it's to be found on medieval maps um, of that area. And so we're proud to call ourselves after one of Drum Chapel's most beautiful features. I'm going to start with core standards. What do core standards mean? Uh, Graham talked about Julian um, and Mary and how um, they became very organized for being able to systematically offer services. And so our view is that without a strong core, without core standards, we're nothing. If we don't get the basics right, inside a GP practice, there's an incredibly intricate and complex number of little systems that just run and run and they can either be got right or got wrong, and when they got wrong, they have implications. So we put a huge amount of effort into lots of um, very small, very mundane, very detailed things. Um, for example, a library of um, good housekeeping guides. How do you do this? How do you do that? How do you do the other? Um, but far more importantly than the organization, it's the people. And uh, <clears throat> Fundamentally for us, until we become a community ourselves, we can't be um, a, a community practice. So um, I'm not going to talk about everything that we've done, but we've put our own well-being and our own, um, uh, our own sustainability. If we treat one another as people with strong relationships, then perhaps we have a hope of treating others in that way. Um, we have had weekly yoga classes for about five years where we've literally been taught to develop a strong core. Um, the, the heart, if you like, of Garskaden Burn University is our monthly protected learning times. Protected not because we have any protected time anymore. Um, we no longer get out of hours cover um, during the day. So um, uh, my colleague Jude Marshall has to work twice as hard um, covering her nursing home on the days of protected learning times. Protected because we've protected them fiercely against all comers and against all pressures. And in those times, um, we look after each other, we share gossip, news, we've met with hospital consultants, um, we talk about our core standards, we imagine the future. Um, that protected learning time is the heart of protecting us as a little community. Um, against all the pressures. Uh, one of those protected learning, every once a year we do a kind of fun day, and one of them was a treasure hunt around Drum Chapel, um, where we played tennis at the local tennis club, where we'd managed to get funding for people to get free tennis lessons if we referred them. Um, and then uh, Annette Fennell, who's our wonderful receptionist, who's just retiring, organized a treasure hunt for us um, to uh, find out places in Drum Chapel where you could do physical activity. Uh, some of us had never walked around Drum Chapel, um, and it was uh, quite eye-opening to see small groups of GPs, nurses, and receptionists um, racing each other for the last clue uh, to win the stunning prize. The second part of our Alma Atta um, practice is uh, care planning. And that's really looking at that part of the declaration which talks about um, self-determination um, and giving people a say, not in what's the matter with them, but what matters to them, to use that phrase. Our colleague uh, Jude Marshall um, has really led the way for us in trying to find ways of simple, practical ways of having conversations with people as they um, enter institutional care using a very simple three questions tool what would you like to happen if these three scenarios come up? Um, we've worked with our link worker, Margaret Ann Prentice, and with um, local third sector group um, to come up with <coughs> planning resources for people with mental health problems um, to say, how, how do you want to manage your mental health? And we take very seriously um, conversations with people about um, dying and planning for death as being perhaps the core and fundamental 
aspect of giving people self-determination in terms of what to do um, when they die. And then the third part of our little boat is community links. Um, not just the GP practice as a community, but the GP practice as part of the community. Um, we were able to um, be, one of, be the, the lead practice for the Community Link Worker Program, and having Margaret Ann Prentice join our practice for the last five years um, has been a, a huge resource for us. Um, another huge resource has been having a receptionist who um, has a tremendous sense of uh, community and compassion. And I, I'm really pleased that Annette Fennell is here today. Um, Annette Fennell started a little group called Promising Links, um, who uh, are featured in a couple of those photographs. Um, about four years ago, uh, we wanted to look at a health issue that we weren't meeting as a practice. Uh, the lady, one of the la ladies at the back of that middle picture is called Linda. And Linda has been being to see me for a number of years. And uh, she asked, well, what can a GP practice do about loneliness? That's got nothing to do with you, she said. Um, Linda suffered from a great many health problems. She still does. Um, her physical health and her, her health is, is poor. Um, and just to say, these are people's real names, and they have given me their explicit consent to share their stories. Um, Linda has gone from being someone who was exceptionally anxious, who would stutter, even in a consultation with a GP, who almost never left the house, um, and who had almost no social circle, through, partly through Annette's gentle encouragement and taking her physically along to the group. Uh, Linda has now become the secretary and treasurer of the group, and she lives and breathes our Promising Links befriending group. Um, about 19 or 20 people going every week. Um, and these are people, this is not about patient consumer groups. This is not saying, you know, is a wallpaper in our waiting room the right color? This is about saying, what can you do to improve your health and your situation and how can we support you to do it? And it's cost virtually nothing. It's cost some time from one of our receptionists and from our link worker. Uh, the group now is a, standalone community group constituted the access small grants to allow them to go and visit the Kelpies and have Christmas parties and things like that. Uh, Chance to Change is another little group which our practice nurses started. It's been running for about two years. Um, this is for people who have cardiovascular risk factors. Um, she was fed up time year after year saying to people, you need to eat differently, you need to stop drinking, you need to exercise. So she started a group to actually help people do this, um, joining up with the cycling group, with uh, stress reduction um, charity, uh, with a cookery class. That group has now gone on. One of the members of the group um, we supported to get a diploma in community development, and uh, that group has now gone on to be led not by our practice nurse, but by one of the members of the group, um, who we've managed to get funding for her to get consultancy payments through Drum Chapel Life, which is the, um, the Healthy Living Centre locally. I could go on. Um, I'll not talk about everything on that slide. Glasgow Wellbeings, um, I will mention, though, um, as, uh, again, our, my colleague Jude Marshall is passionate about lifestyle medicine and about how the way that we eat, the way that we move, the way that we sleep, and the fundamentals of what we do affect our health. And she's taken the practical step with another GP in Glasgow, setting up an online group who meet uh, regularly um, to explore and develop the idea of how that can be incorporated into our life. So all of these are small scale. This is nothing earth shattering. Um, and at the same time, the practice in its conception of itself sees itself as a community of people, as a place where we try and help people plan and have a say in what they want to happen to them and also as people who belong to a community through our workplace and who do what we can to contribute to that community. But the core of what we do is clinical care. We're primarily a medical practice. Um, by hook and by crook, um, we've managed slowly to increase the number of doctor sessions that we can offer to patients. Um, we know a lot of crooks, I run the drug clinics, so 
Um, we haven't had to access their assistance yet, but we would do what it takes, given that the Scottish Government and local NHS have no interest in increasing sessions um, in deprived areas. So we've had to develop um, a business sense to do it ourselves. Our last um, great bit of decision making was having my colleague Dr John Daly join us as an extra half-time GP, bringing our practice list per whole time equivalent down to about a thousand patients per whole time equivalent GP. So John and Mary have given me their permission to talk about their story um, because ultimately it's about people and it's about the clinical care that we offer. I've known John for about 15 years. Um, he has a background of heroin addiction, relationship breakup, um, lost access to his child many years ago. For about five years, John couldn't walk. He had a hemiparesis, like, like a stroke, down one side of his body. Um, put through every neurological test, there is nothing wrong with him. He was diagnosed as having a functional neurological problem. He had severe depression uh, for many years, developed chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. I tried to copy his uh, read code list from his notes, um, but it was so long that the text is in minutely small, so you couldn't read it. Um, about two or three years ago, he, he, I noticed a little spot next to his eye, and he had a, a squamous cell cancer removed from his face, um, which has left a scar, but which thankfully was removed entirely. And then about just over a year ago, um, I noticed that he was quite hoarse, and he said, yes, he'd been hoarse for about two months, but didn't want to say anything because his uncle had died of throat cancer, so if he said something, he might find out he had that himself, which is what he did have. So he had his larynx removed. Um, he uh, had a very difficult time in hospital. He was labelled as being non-compliant with the advice that he was given. And after his larynx was removed, he was in and out of hospital for about nine months, with chest infections, aspiration of mucus, um, bleeding, um, every kind of complication. And then, uh, if you see the, the second letter down, um, he was admitted in September of last year, uh, September, October, after injecting heroin to end his life. Um, he was seen by a liaison psychiatrist who um, asked him whether he regretted doing it, uh, and as he said he did, he lobbed him out and said no need for any psychiatric follow-up, but perhaps he might want to get some primary care services. So um, I had a long chat with John and his mother, and we talked about um, the fact that he was now disabled. Potentially being disabled was uh, better in society's eyes than being a, a heroin addict. So in some respects, his life had got better. Um, and we also talked about focusing on what he can do and not on what he can't do. And uh, I made some uh, worthy suggestions of things that he might be able to do. He came back to see me a couple of weeks later and he was full of excitement. He said, you know that talk you had about what I can do? Well, I've started doing something. I've taken up rollerblading. I took a very big gulp and said, great. <laughs> That's exactly what I'm talking about. Go for it. You might want to look at the letter, uh, two down. <laughs> so between um, taking up rollerblading and being admitted with a right intertrochanteric fracture at the rollerblading, um, he wasn't admitted once to hospital for chest infection. He absolutely glowed with energy and vitality. He'd made loads of friends. He was quite a celebrity as the only person at the rollerblading with a tracheostomy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I phoned him, because uh, he's not able to get down to the surgery um, in the new year, and said, uh, how are you getting on? somewhat worried that I was going to get sued for encouraging my patient to, to break his own hip. Um, and he said, I'm doing fantastic. I've never felt better. I can't wait to get back rollerblading. <laughs> he's even going and sitting at the side of the rink so that people come and talk to him because he's very popular. Mary, his mother, um, has a ton of health problems herself. 
And do you know what? Mary looks after John, and John looks after Mary. And the reason I tell this story is not really because it makes a point, but precisely because it doesn't make a point, because John and Mary's health is just a story of being scared, of being heroic, um, of being brave, of looking after one another, perhaps of making mistakes, taking risks, um, of interdependence with one another and of relationships. And fundamentally, that's what clinical care is. When my partners and I talk to each other now about cases and about patients, primarily what we talk about are things like raising children and what do you do with babies when they vomit or when children run around too much and make life difficult. Eating and drinking, moving and being active, elderly uh, moving and being active, young people moving and being active, avoiding noxious substances, of which there are many on offer in Drum Chapel, belonging and connecting, uh, like Linda, uh, recovering from traumatic events, including sickness and illness, coping with worry, sadness, bereavement, poverty, adapting, finding purpose, adjusting to old, old age. Old age is fantastic for many people. I don't know many people for whom old, old age is not a misery. For some people, old, old age is quite a short period of time. For others, it's a very long period of time. But it's almost universally a miserable experience, and I think. And I think helping people to understand the difference between old age and old, old age, and helping people to prepare for it and to still find dignity and meaning within it is a core function which I think we've lost. And of course, preparing for dying. Now, behind all the medical technology, the diagnoses and the labels and the read codes, these are all fantastic technologies that help us to achieve these goals. Um, without good COPD uh, pharmacology, um, then it is much harder to adapt to COPD. But the most powerful technology that we've evolved as human beings to deal with health and to create health is community. It's because of community that we survived as a species it's because of community that we can thrive and live. So I want us to come and see community not as something on the outside, something on the margins, something that's not hospital. Community is the very core of health. There is no health without community. Um, when the Declaration of Alma-Ata talks about primary health care, it doesn't mean primary care the way it's used in the NHS. It doesn't mean the bottom of a heap of importance. Primary healthcare means the primary function of the healthcare system. Okay, so my view of what the future will be a um, hundred years after Alma Ata in 2078 is of primary healthcare not by GPs, but by orthopedic surgeons and neurosurgeons and um, nurses and GPs and all kinds of people we haven't even dreamed up yet for whom being part of the community, both treating themselves as community, contributing to community, and having relationships with people who are self-reliant and who determine their own health, that is what primary health care will be. I think that general practice now has the potential, the exceptional potential, to use the buzz phrase, to begin to make that a reality in the present, not in 2078. Um, and I actually think what I discovered in my GP partners made them tick was the same as what makes me tick. And actually, to be honest, every GP and everybody in this room really, if it boils down to it, is what makes us tick. And I think it is possible for us to, even in very small ways, even in very imperfect and frustrating ways, to actually make these things a reality now. And so I'm really grateful that you give me the opportunity to share some of our experience at Garskadenburn with you. Thank you.